chapter 10, if you will, this afternoon. Righteousness. How are you saved? We believe unto righteousness. 
That's the first point I want to bring out this afternoon. Accepting Jesus as your Savior, accepting Jesus as Savior is a matter of the heart. I say that as opposed to meaning this, being saved is not a matter of the mind. If it was about how much we know about God or how we can intellectually, intellectually ascend to uh, a certain amount of knowledge, then a man named Nicodemus in John chapter number 3 wouldn't have needed Jesus in order to be saved because he was plenty smart enough. Uh, he had all of the knowledge that he needed. It's not a matter of the mind. It's not a matter of the substance, how much you can accumulate in this lifetime. If that was the case, then there was a rich young ruler that would not have needed to be saved. He would not have needed Jesus in order to have his sins forgiven. Being saved is not a matter of the works of our hands. If that was the case, Cain's sacrifice in the Old Testament would have been acceptable unto God. Uh, it's not a matter of status for if salvation was a matter of status, Saul of Tarsus later became the Apostle Paul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews, would not have needed Jesus to be saved. And it's not a matter of any of those things, but it is a heart decision to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. The word that's used here in verse number 10, with a heart man believeth unto righteousness. To trust and put our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. I like the word that's used to describe soul salvation here, and that is the word righteousness. With a heart man believeth unto righteousness. How is that? Well, we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Because we are saved. This righteousness describes a new characterization of our life. We are now characterized as righteous because we are righteous in Christ. For God gave him who knew no sin, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse 21. We have, we're characterized by righteousness. And now, being saved also, uh, it describes a new creation. We have a consciousness, this righteousness, we have a consciousness that with Christ in me, now I can do what's right. I can be in the will of God. I can overcome sin in my life. I have a new heart in Jesus Christ. Thank God for the righteousness of Christ. The Lord knows my own righteousness wasn't getting me anywhere before I got saved. So, we have a new heart. And then the rest of this chapter, number 10, deals with the fact and revolves around and is the result of our new life in Christ. The heart of Romans 10 is for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Soul salvation. And then the rest of the chapter revolves around that. The second thing I want to bring up is our new heart now drives our mouth. The end of verse number 10, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. There's our little word that we've studied before, unto, the Greek word is eis, E-I-S, and it means uh, it can mean in order to obtain, and it can also mean because of. We looked at this word out of Acts chapter number 2 extensively here a few weeks ago. Uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, baptized for the remission of sin. We said that, that in that case and in that context, it means to be baptized because of the fact that you are saved. Because of the remission of sin. This word is used various ways. In Romans chapter number 10, the first part of verse number 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, we could say, with the heart man believeth in order to obtain righteousness, in order to be saved. 
But in the second part of that verse, we can use it in a different way. And with the mouth, confession is made because of salvation. And so we have the fact that our new heart, our new life, drives our mouth, our words. We are confessing. What are we confessing? What, what are we confessing? Verse number 9 tells us we are to confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, we are to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is to be done obviously privately uh, between you and God, uh, acknowledging that God is your Lord and, and uh, that He is the master of your life. Also, it is to be done publicly. When Paul was writing to the Romans, you understand the implications here of a confession with the mouth was a death sentence for Christians under the Roman government. And when Paul wrote this, he was writing to people who he knew would be persecuted and was trying to encourage them and empower them to go ahead and publicly profess and confess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So privately and publicly is what we're talking about. In connection with the confession of the mouth, verse number 9 adds that our heart is at the same time reminded and leaning on the fact that Jesus is alive and well and is in heaven. He's risen from the grave. Look at verse number 9. If thou shalt confess with the Lord, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. So now... Our heart is leaning on the fact that Jesus is alive and in control and, and, and has us in the palm of his hands. Our mouth is confessing this publicly. And I believe this is a simple case of the more you say it, the more assured you become of it. Just say it more and more and more. The more that you say Jesus is Lord, the vocalization of our faith is good for the heart. Preaching. And I can say this on, a, on an experiential basis. Preaching is good for the heart. The more I say it to you, the more good it does for me. The more that you tell other people about your faith and your testimony, it strengthens your heart. Whenever we start singing about the Lord Jesus Christ, it does something in our hearts. And the more we sing... The more it does for us. It's just as simple as that, I think. Verse number 9 ends by telling us that the two things working together, that is, believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth, that these two things working together does something for us. It says, uh, If thou shalt confess the Lord with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart, God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, Schofield, if you have a Schofield Bible, he takes us with that word saved back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 where it talks about salvation. And in his commentary there, he tells us about the various types of salvation. There's eternal salvation. There's daily salvation. There's salvation from the troubles and trials of life, which is what I believe it's talking about right here. A daily deliverance from troubles, either physical or or spiritual, whenever we start telling people and professing our faith publicly, and we start believing in our heart and, uh, and leaning on the fact in our heart that Jesus is alive and well and in control of all of our circumstances, God delivers spiritual and even sometimes physical protection from the daily troubles of life. We're delivered from these things uh, in life. Our newness of heart, number three, drives our happiness. Verse number 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. People have taken that verse and said, well, if you're really saved, and they'll say this like this, if you're really saved, you would be telling people about it. If you're really saved, you'll be confessing with the mouth. That's not what this verse is talking about. When it says you'll not be ashamed, that word ashamed means you're not going to be let down. You're not going to be disappointed in the Lord. You're not going to be left empty uh, in placing your faith and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And there's always this ever-looming question amongst those who are critics of our once saved, always saved position as Baptists. They say, well, if a person can choose to be saved, can't they choose to be lost again? Well, to me, that's a futile argument. I've never known anybody that was saved that wanted to be lost again. Uh, have you ever met anybody that was saved that was disappointed that they got saved? I mean, I'm not. It just keeps getting better, gooder and gooder, as the old preacher said. Uh, I'm not disappointed, and I, I've never known anybody else that was disappointed. By the way, I don't believe you can lose your salvation for any reason. But I've never known anybody that was disappointed in being saved. And uh, in our context here, talking about people who are staring down the gun barrel of Roman persecution, uh, but these believers who would lean on God would not be disappointed when God protected them and saved them from the daily struggles and trials of life. They would be happy. However it is that God works in their life, whether He removes them from persecution or whether He applies a peace that passes all understanding during the storms of life, however God decides to choose to deliver them, they would be happy with it. They're, they're going to be happy. God has a way of making us happy. Believers, Christians, ought to be the happiest people in this world. But their, their losses would be weighed against their spiritual gain. And Paul said, I count it all but loss for the sake of Christ. Uh, it, I, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the mentality that's being presented here. These people were, would be happy because their confidence was in God. Their troubles would be their opportunities to experience the goodness of God. I, I've been looking at a verse uh, in Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews chapter number 11, where it talks about old Jacob in the Old Testament. It says he gets down to the end of his life. He's, he, he's found there. He's dying. And he blesses his two sons. And he worships God. But then it says this, leaning upon the top of his staff. You know why he's doing that? Because God touched the hollow of his thigh one day and he limped the rest of his life. And that's a picture of Jacob looking way back down through the days of his life and being able to thank God for the limp in his life. And, uh, and, and being able to find happiness in the fact that God's hand was all over his life. Our new heart drives our happiness. Number four, our new heart drives our focus. Verses 12 and 13. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The troubles and trials of life are inescapable. You're going to have them. I wish I could tell you get saved and you'd never have any trouble ever again. I remember uh, listening to a preacher, an old preacher, said that when he was a kid, they had told him, if you'll get saved, you'll never have any more problems. He said, if I ever find that guy, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> the troubles of life are inescapable. John 16, 33. You shall have tribulation. It's a it, it, in the world, you shall have tribulation. It's just the way it is. The cry for hell is inevitable. Sooner or later, you may not have reached the point in life yet, but someday you'll reach the point in life where you cannot help yourself, and you're going to cry out. You're either going to cry out to your family or your friends, or you're going to cry out to God, but someday you're going to find yourself in need of help a uh, solution to problems that you can't solve on your own. For the believer, there is an overriding focal point. We are driven to call upon the name of our Lord for help. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't think that's talking about eternal salvation. I think that's talking about daily salvation. We'll be Delivered, will be helped if we'll call upon the name of our Lord. Why is that? Well, it's with an understanding that He has all power.
power in verse 12, it tells us that He is Lord over all. He's, he's Lord enough that He can take all of our sins away. And he's Lord and God enough that He can solve any problem that we have. He's all we need, and He's a whole lot more. He has all power. And then also in verse number 12, it reminds us that He has all resources. He is rich. Uh, it tells us that God is rich to all that call upon Him. That word rich is just as simple as it gets. It means that He has a whole lot. I, I, I remember one time we went shopping when Cole was little. Went to a mall and for some reason I'd done a job and got paid in cash and we had a whole bunch of cash with us. And I say a whole bunch. It was a, a paycheck that we had cashed and, and uh, gave his mom some money and gave his sister some money and they were all going to different stores and Cole looked up at me and said, Dad, where are you getting all these Benjamins? <laughs> I think he thought I was rich. But I tell you, God has everything that we need. Everything that we need at His disposal. I thought about the words of this old song. It is no secret what God can do for what He's done for others. He can do for you. God is the Lord over all the resources. He's available unto all that call upon Him. Say, preacher, why do you preach? Why do you sing? Why do you worship? Why do you pray? Because many years ago, God came to where I was and saved my soul and put a new life within me. And since then, there's this ever-present drawing of my attention. In sin, I tried to get away from God, and there's this drawing back. He has a way of bringing us back into uh, focusing upon Him uh, it, it's, it, it's an addiction, isn't it? God is just, uh, we become addicted to the, the presence of God. I cannot get enough of the goodness and awesomeness of God. I thank, he, thank the Lord He saved my soul. And I thank goodness, that, thank the Lord that we have a, 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 a God that we can turn to in times of trouble. Whosoever shall call upon Him shall be saved. I'm glad that whenever we have uh, anything that we can't deal with in life, we have a God that can deal with it all. Amen. Let's stay. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be in your house, Lord. We thank you for saving us. Thank you for uh, giving us a way that we can be right with you, have all of our sins forgiven. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know that salvation today, I pray that, uh, that the words spoken, the song sung, would uh, find a lodging place in their heart, Lord, that it would drive them to consider their relationship with Jesus Christ, and Lord, that they would be faced with the decision of whether or not to accept or reject Christ as Savior. Lord, I pray that, uh, that you would uh, take the words that have been preached today and strengthen the heart of every believer, encourage us, strengthen us, Lord, for the work that you have for us to do this week. Give us the opportunity to witness. Lord, uh, remind us when, when we need to pray and who we need to pray for and what we need to pray about. Lord, help us with that as we uh, go throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.